Greetings to all of you. I am Dr. Geeta Kadeprat and I am a breast surgeon at Max Hospital, Delhi. Uh, so today I am going to take you through breast physiology. So we must understand that to know what is an abnormality, we also need to know what is the normal. So I will take you through the normal and abnormal development as well as function of the breast so that you get an overview of what to expect at different phases of life as far as the breast goes. So the mammary gland is composed of an epithelial system of ducts and also lobuloalveolar units, which is, which is embedded in a mesenchymal derived fat pad. So the growth and uh, morphogenesis of these epithelial structures happens alongside the hormonal changes that are happening in the body and it is also affected by genetic mutations. So various parts of the breast are affected by specific hormones and I will come to, you, uh, come to it as we go along. So the rela relationship of the epithelium to the mesenchyme in normal growth is key to the understanding of the developmental abnormalities and factors that may lead to disease. So uh, my talk is going to be divided into these five parts. So I will talk to you about embryology to childhood. The second would be on puberty, the third pregnancy, fourth lactation, and then the fifth is menopause. And that uh, literally takes you through the entire gamut of changes that can happen within the breast. So the mammary tree, it consists of ductal and periductal connective tissue elements. That is what is by and large the structure. So the lateral branches of the ducts, they lead to terminal ducts and they end in terminal duct lobular units. You'll hear this off and on as you come into clinical practice, the TDLU. So this is what the TDLU is. And these units comprise numerous asini surrounded by the fibroblastic stroma. So now the stroma is very rich in blood vessels, in lymphatics, immune cells and also an extracellular mat matrix which provides a very conducive environment for the epithelial cell growth, differentiation and also regression during morphogenesis. So four different lobular structures have been characterized in the breast of women who are post-pubertal, each one with, uh, which has got um, which represents sequential developmental stages. So if I talk about lobule type 1, these are virginal lobules and are present even before menarche happens. And these are composed of about 6 to 11 ductules per lobule. And there is type 2, which evolves from the lobule type 1. And they have a more complex morphology. And they have a higher number of ductules per lobule. And lobule type 3 has an average of about 80 ductules or alveoli per lobule. And they are the ones which are frequently seen in women during hormonal stimulation or during pregnancy. And lobule type 4 is the one which is the functional bit during, seen during the lactational period, but it is not seen in the nulliparous post-pubertal breasts. So this type is considered to be the maximal expression of development and differentiation when the breast prepares itself to lactate. So this uh, diagram is just a representation of what I've just told you as to how the lobules from uh, lobule 1 to 2 to 3 under the influence of various hormones. And uh, as you grow older, as you return to turn to menopause, how the lobules 3 and 4 return back to uh, lobule 1, which is what was there at the uh, start of uh, the evolution of these lobules. So in early pubert puberty, the TDLU is termed a virginal lobule or lobule type 1. So as uh, under the influence of the ovarian hormone, some of the lobules 1 will differentiate into lobule type 2. And lobule type 2 are present in moderate numbers till during the late teens, but then after the mid-20s, they start declining. In the first term pregnancy, uh, if the first term pregnancy occurs before the third decade of life, the number of lobule 3 increases significantly. So lobule 3 is what remains the dominant structure in all pa Paris women until the fourth decade of life, after which it starts to decline and then it involutes to a lobule type 1 or 2 after menopause. So in nulliparous women, you have more undifferentiated structures such as terminal ducts and lobule type 1, occasional type 2 and type 3. 
So lobule 1 is what remains a constant throughout their lifespan. Lobules type 2 are present till up to the early teens and then they sharply decrease after age 23 and the number of lobule 1 remain significantly higher. Compare this with the Paris women, the predominant structure is mostly lobule type 3. But this remains uh, active during the reproductive years and starts decreasing after the fourth decade of life. So during the postmenopausal uh, years, both Paris and Nully Paris women have a predominantly lobule type 1. Although the ductal breast cancer originates in lobules type 1 or the terminal ductal lobular units, the TDLU, epidemiologically it is seen that Nully Paris women exhibit a higher incidence of breast cancer than Paris women. So to understand the protective effect of parity, so some uh, areas were studied, which is proliferative activity, the steroid receptors, the angiogenic index, protease inhibitor, serpin, and mammary-derived growth inhibitor. So these were measured in these three types of lobules, that is type 1, 2, and 3, in both Paris as well as Nully Paris women. So what was seen is that in the lobule 1, there is uh, the proliferation rate is the highest and uh, both estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors are also expressed significantly. Lobule 1 also has the highest angiogenic index and the number of vessels in relation to the number of alveoli is also high but there is no expression of the protease inhibitors. So when the progression happens from lobule 1 to lobule 3, the percentage of lobules that are receptor positive and the proliferation and the angiogenic index all decrease. And there is expression of the protease inhibitors. So postmenopausal women who were Paris ultimately have the same percentage of lobule 1 as the nulliparous women, but the proliferative index of lobule 1 in Nully Paris women is much higher than that of Paris women. And this difference does persist through menopause also. So now I come to the embryology. I will take you through this phase of the early development, the fetal development to childhood. So the formation of the breast in the newborn begins in the sixth week of fetal development. So during the fifth or sixth week of development, there are two ventral bands of thickened ectoderm. This is ectoderm which invaginates into, which, which is present in the embryo. These are called the mammary ridges. And these uh, multilayered epithelial ridges, also known as milk lines, extend from the axilla to the groin and give rise to a single pair of placodes. And these placodes are a cluster of primitive mammary epithelial cells which are present over the thorax, corresponding to roughly the intercostal space 4. Each gland develops as an ingrowth of the ectoderm, which is the primary bud, and that invaginates into the underlying mesoderm or the mesenchyme. Each primary bud gives rise to 15 or 20 secondary buds or outgrowths, and during the fetal period, Epithelial cords develop from the secondary buds and they extend into the surrounding connective tissue. So by the time the prenatal life comes to an end, lumens develop within these outgrowths to form the lactiferous ducts and their branches. At birth, these lactiferous ducts open into a shallow epithelial depression and call the mammary pit. Now this pit gradually elevates and transforms into a nipple shortly after birth as a result of proliferation of the mesenchyme underlying the future nipple and areola. Sometimes this pit fails to elevate and that is how we see a lot of women who present to us with this inverted nipple. So inverted nipple can be an indication of disease but if the patient were to say that my nipple has always been like that, you can assume that this is a congenital condition and not something that was acquired because of disease. So at term, the, at term birth, the birth, breast has about six to eight widely patent ducts that empty at the nipple. All of these initial ducts have one layer of epithelium and one layer of myoepithelial cells and it end, uh, ends in a saccule or a dilated sac. These ductules 
give rise to the lobulo alveolar structures and the these are the ultimate milk producing uh, units or the milk producing factory as you'd like to call it. So the initial uh, fetal stages of breast development, these, that is not influenced by the sex uh, steroid in, uh, hormones. At birth, however, the in withdrawal of the maternal hormones results in secretion of neonatal prolactin and that sometimes can present as nipple uh, secretion, newborn uh, nipple secretion. So if you talk about the nipple, the various clinical correlates I'll take you through. So you can have polythelia, polythelia meaning multiple nipples, polymastia meaning multiple breast uh, tissues, um, accessory axillary breast tissue, amastia, absence of breast, pollen syndrome, newborn nipple discharge, premature thalarchy and precocious puberty. So I'll take each of these uh, topics as we go along. But it is interesting to know that we follow this classification system to access, characterize accessory breast tissue, which was developed in 1915 and continues to be used to, to date. So the first uh, point is the presence of a complete breast with mammary gland tissue and nipple areolar complex. This is the normal breast that we are talking about. Then you could have a situation where there is presence of gland, and tish, gland tissue and nipple. Then there could be a gland tissue and areola. These are the various variations you can have. You can just have the gland uh, without the nipple areola. You can have nipple areola with fat replacement of the mammary gland. This is known as the pseudomamma. You can have just nipple alone without the gland or the areola. Or you can have only the areola, which is called the polythelia areola, areolaris. And the presence of a small batch, uh, patch of hair bearing tissue which is polythelia pilosa. So now I come to polythelia and polymastia. So supernumerary nipples, multiple nipples is what is polythelia and supernumerary breasts is what is polymastia. And these are relatively common congenital abnormalities in relation to the rest of the abnormalities, that's why it's called common, with an incidence of approximately 0.2 to 2.5% uh, polythelia and 0.1 to 1% polymastia. So both of these deform uh, deformities are observed alongside the milk lines that track from the axilla to the groin as I previously mentioned. Both supernumerary nipples and breasts form from a failure of normal regression of the milk rich during gestation. So diagnosis of supernumerary nipples can be made even at birth. The most common site of polythelia is just inferior to the uh, normal breast and the most common site for an accessory breast is the axilla. So polythelia represents the most common variant of supernumerary breast components and occurs predominantly between the breast and the umbilicus. Um, again, like I said, it is evident at birth and supernumerary and ectopic breast tissue is evident only after hormonal stimulation that occurs at, at puberty or during pregnancy. So ectopic breast tissue is subject to the same pathological changes that occur in a normally positioned breast. So polythelia may be associated with other abnormalities, which is uh, usually urological malformations or even urogenital malignancies. So polythelia should always be looked for in a routine physical examination of a newborn and this condition should be notified to the parents. This is important because supernumerary breasts in females can respond to fluctuations in hormones in a physiological manner, such that there is pubertal enlargement of this, this piece. There could be premenstrual swellings, uh, tenderness and lactation during pregnancy and parturition can occur and nobody should get alarmed if such a thing were to happen. Patients with polythelia may also exhibit the same spectrum of pathological diseases and something that I've noticed that you've got a breast cancer developing in an accessory breast. So you can get cancer, you can get fibroadenomas, you can get cysts. All those bits can be seen in these, uh, these supernumerary uh, breasts or nipples as well. So in uh, embryogenesis, polythelia occurs in the third month of gestation. That is the time when the mammary ridge is supposed to regress, but here it fails to regress normally. So this is also an event which is coincident with the development of urogenital and other organ systems. So 
Although various malformations have been associated with polythelia, but the highest incidence is that of renal anomalies and malignancies in children with supernumerary nipples.